My name is Kayla Blinko. I'm currently an assistant professor at the University of the Virgin Islands. Uh, the work that I am going to be talking about that's being published in Pure J was actually done uh, at my previous institution when I was a PhD student at Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego. So the research that we have getting published in Pure J centers on giant sea bass. Uh, their scientific name is Stereolepis gigas. They are a really culturally iconic and important species in the coastal waters of Southern California and Baja California, Mexico. If you're someone who grew up uh, in the coastal community, maybe involved with fishing or involved with the diving community in Southern California or Baja, you probably have a story related with giant sea bass. Uh, they are a truly amazing fish. They are the largest bony fish that can be found in that region. Um, and they're, they kind of have this interesting history in terms of their interaction with fisheries management, uh, fishing activities, as well as just kind of their role as top predators in the environment. So uh, back in the early 1900s in the United States, uh, these fish were targeted pretty heavily. So they're one of many uh, fish species that form seasonal spawning aggregations. So uh, a couple months out of the year, they all come together and they uh, in these big groups and they spawn. Um, and this makes them really susceptible to being caught by fishermen. If you can identify where their spawning aggregation is, you can go and catch a bunch of them all at once. Um, and so people kind of caught on to this and started catching them. Um, and what happened was, is we basically completely knocked down their populations in Southern California. And by the 1970s, it was almost impossible to see a giant sea bass in the United States. Um, so this is kind of a bummer, <laughs> uh, but there is a positive side to the story in that, um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife implemented a number of different fisheries management, um, strategies that kind of helped this species turn around. Uh, so some of those things were one regulation specifically on giant sea bass, but also the banning of nearshore gill nets in California. And so all of these kind of fisheries management strategies combined has led to their kind of starting to recover in Southern California. Um, and as an ecologist, as a researcher, this is really cool because we now have an opportunity to ask and answer questions about just like fundamental aspects of their ecology um, that we've never been able to ask before because their populations were just so depressed. Uh, so we went from basically, you never see these guys, they're like the stuff of legends, to now you can go scuba diving in San Diego and see a giant sea bass sometimes, not all the time. They haven't recovered that much. Um, but What's really cool, again, as a researcher is that I now have the opportunity to ask and answer questions about them. And what we were really interested in in this study was thinking about their movement ecology. So thinking about how these animals use space. What is their home range size? Do they have seasonal differences in the areas where they occupy? Do they tend to stay in one location for years at a time? Our goal with this study was to track giant sea bass to be able to answer questions about their fundamental movement ecology. So how big are their home ranges? Do they show seasonal differences in their movement patterns? Can we see them doing different movement behaviors during spawning season? Um, beyond kind of these just fundamental questions, we were also interested in seeing how giant sea bass were interacting with existing spatial management measures as well as local recreational fishing activity. So we conducted this study in La Jolla. Um, it's actually where Scripps Institution of Oceanography is located. And it was the perfect place to do the study because in that region, uh, there are multiple marine protected areas, as well as one of the most highly trafficked recreational fishing grounds in San Diego. And the reason we were interested in this is that one of the things that we think might be influencing giant sea bass kind of in this contemporary age in the United States where um, people aren't really allowed to catch them is accidental or incidental catch of giant sea bass. So um, sometimes when you're fishing for other things as a recreational fisherman, uh, you can accidentally catch a giant sea bass. And this is potentially problematic because they're very susceptible to barotrauma. So if you catch a fish 
that's at depth and you bring it to the surface really quickly, that change in pressure can influence them negatively uh, by causing physiological stress as well as influencing, like basically causing some of their organs to expand. And in some cases, this can cause fatality of the fish. And we don't really have an understanding of the impact of this on giant sea bass. Um, and so a part of this study, we were interested in seeing, you know, what is the potential for these animals to really be interacting with this potential threat? Um, as well as, you know, how are they interacting with these marine protected areas that are in the same area? Um, and so the way that we did this was to acoustically tag uh, giant sea bass. So, so we would catch them and we would tag them with an acoustic transmitter. And this transmitter pings a characteristic sound. Um, and as that animal moves around with that tag, making this pinging sound, we put out a bunch of different uh, receivers in the environment. And so as that animal moves around, if it goes next to a receiver, that receiver will hear that ping and say, this animal was at this location at this time. And in this way, we can actually track their movements through the space. Um, so we did this for multiple years. <laughs> and um, what we ended up finding was that the fish that we tagged were seemed to be resident to La Jolla. So um, all the fish that kind of stuck around post tagging uh, stayed in the La Jolla array for multiple months at a time. The fish that we, ta that we tracked for the longest period was there for four years, almost consecutively. Um, and so that's a, that's a, strong indication that La Jolla could be an important area for this species because these animals were happy to spend lots and lots and lots of time there. Um, we also found that uh, they tended to spend a considerable amount of time outside of the marine protected areas. So they did spend a lot of time in this area where there's a lot of recreational fishing activity. Um, and that's potentially problematic, but like along with that, the, the, the amount of space that these animals use was relatively small. And so um, a huge caveat to this is that we fished and caught these animals outside of marine protected areas and released them outside of marine protected areas. So it's possible that there are animals living inside of the marine protected areas that are having these small home ranges that are getting protection from those MPAs. Um, so basically the combination of our finding that they have really high site fidelity to small areas, as well as, um, the fact that we tag them outside of marine protected areas, kind of on the flip side, suggests that any animals that do kind of reside in those areas that are protected are likely getting protection from that. Um, one of the other things that we found was that during the spawning season, um, they tended to spend more time outside of the MPAs. And we suspect that there might be a spawning aggregation site um, kind of in these highly trafficked recreational fishing areas, um, which is potentially problematic. We don't really have an understanding of the level of threat of incidental catch to this species. And so that's definitely an avenue for future research. Um, so... What kinds of lessons do I hope my readers take away from this research? Um, first off, if you're a fisherman, I hope that you do whatever you can in your power to uh, make sure that you release these guys properly. If you can, just send them back to depth um, to help kind of stave off the negative impacts of barotrauma. Being able to uh, build knowledge about kind of the fundamental aspects about a species ecology is so important because it's the stepping stone to being able to understand and ask more in-depth questions about them. Um, and so, and this is so important, especially when we're talking about a species that's so culturally iconic. Um, so I hope that people kind of see the value in doing kind of this just fundamental ecological research because it gives us valuable kind of baseline information to be able to ask questions that might be more applied. And kind of along that vein, um, I hope people take away that there's still so much to be learned about these fish. Um, and I hope this encourages people to ask more questions and go out and learn more about giant sea bass because they really are an amazing animal. Um, and I hope that 
people get to experience how cool they are for generations to come.